mercy, Lord of mercy. Through the prayers of our Holy Fathers, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and save us. Amen. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'll share my screen with you so we can continue where we stopped the last time. Feel free, as always, to um, uh, raise your hand or just un un unmute yourself if you have any questions to ask. We'll continue with this topic that we had uh, for the past uh, few uh, Bible studies. Uh, let me see the share screen. I hope this time will be okay. We will um, try to cover the answer to the questions of, as you remember, will the torments of Hades have an end? And what we want to do now is we want to go back to the um, uh, to the slides so we can uh, continue where we stopped the last time. As you know, we followed the book, uh, not the book, but the, the excerpts from uh, Father uh, Georgi Maximov's um, uh, talk or essay or book, if you will, maybe it's uh, uh, exposition on the, the, the heresy of the apocatastasis or the restoration, which is the answering the questions, will the torments Will the torments of uh, hell have of hates have an end? Of course, we, we said the last time, that's how we started our Bible study. The short answer is no. And uh, the rebirth of the concept of the apocatastasis in the 20th and in the 20th, 21st centuries is a serious issue because unfortunately we see a lot of uh, people who have very secular understanding of our faith have been um, introducing this uh, heresy of origin initially started by him. Uh, as you remember, Father Matthew talked about uh, this uh, father who uh, was a priest from Alexandria. And even though he didn't insist it on his own uh, teachings as a dogma, as a revelation of God to the church, still his teachings became very popular and, and got enrooted in certain parts of the, of the Christian church and became heresies. Today, that is popular because basically what apocatastasis teach is that God, out of enormity of his love for mankind and for all of his creation, because everything that he created, created good, at the end, on the last judgment, and this is a heresy, he will bring back to its previous existence of purity and innocency as it was before the fall. The issues we have with this, and that's what we're discussing now, we had what we call the metaphysical arguments, the moral arguments. Today, we're going to talk a little bit more about the moral argument, about why is this wrong, the juridical argument. And of course, we'll get to the point where we're going to have to uh, talk about the argument based on an incorrectly understood teaching on Christ's descent into hates. The main reason we, we say this is because if God forgives everyone's sins, at the end, after the last judgment, means that there is no reason for us to fast, to pray, to be good, to, to be Christians. Basically, all the commandments that Christ gave us are uh, down to the trash. We don't need them because I can be a sinner. I can uh, live my life as I want, not as Christ wants, not as God wants. Because ultimately, it is not just myself will be saved uh, in that state of apocatastasis, but also the devil. So to us, this heresy might look very obvious and very uh, incorrect but you know people from the past who were intellectualizing the theology of the church trying to reason the theological thought they would always fail because the devil who is much more experienced than us and many many times more intelligent than us will always find logical and intellectual justifications to uh, take us away from God and from the truth, which it's not an idea, it's not an ideology, but it's Christ himself. Truth is a person. So we had talking about the last time about the metaphysical arguments about uh, this is Father George Borowski and uh, St. Gregory the theologian, uh, Father John Meyer was quoting some of the councils who were condemning uh, this uh, theology, this heresy which was actually finally being condemned on the Fifth Ecumenical Council, and not today, but in the following Bibles, and that's how we're going to finish this, let's say, lectures about the heresy of apocatastasis, by how the fathers understand this, and why they have issue with this, and why it was uh, condemned on the Fifth Ecumenical Council. So this is considered to be heresy. The reason we talk about this is not because we want to revisit the heresies of the church, because there are 
millions of, of those being present and recorded in the history of the church, but rather because today we live in, in a world where the ancient heresies are just getting a different form of existence and being repackaged. And unfortunately, even among Christians have been distributed and adopted and accepted that today they start to speculate, start to intellectuals, again, playing with the same ideas that are, of course, uh, already uh, in the ancient times uh, recognized and condemned as heresies. So we talked about the metaphysical government uh, arguments, and we said that there can be no universal salvation because it is not just. And when we say this, uh, for example, in Galatians, St. Paul says, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. And even the words of Christ himself in Matthew 25, 46, he says, and this will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. And there are many other examples from, from just from the scriptures, not even touching the holy, um, the holy tradition of the church, which is even more abundant with this information, that yes, there is. A punishment yes there is real hell and eternal for, uh, torment and yes there is eternal life in the closeness of god we see that also from the story in uh, the gospel of saint john about the rich man and lazarus and many others about where, where it talks about the afterlife and what happens to us so this is very important to understand today we're going to continue about the uh, that uh, conversation Another uh, thing what Matt was asking me about is, uh, does God has passion? Meaning, uh, when we, we talked the last time, the biblical term wrath or anger of God by John Chrysostom is understood in a completely different way. God does not, what we say that according to the Holy Fathers, the biblical term wrath of God or the anger of God, like for example, is described in John 3.36 or Romans or Ephesians 5.6 and so, etc., should not be understood in an anthropomorphic sense. St. John Chrysostomus explains, and this is what we talked just before we started recording uh, today's Bible studies with Matt. This is what St. John says. When you hear the words such as anger and wrath used in relation to God, do not suppose that there is anything human meant in them. Meaning God does not have human passions like we. God is passionless in that sense. Scripture says God gets angry, not attributing passion to him, but expressing by this language his punishing action and making an impression on dense men. So sometimes the Bible uh, has to use the anthropomorphological language in order for us to be understood. I've told you before that uh, according to the dogmatics of the church, even the angels themselves, if they appear to us in their real form, in their real dimension, if you will, then uh, we will all be scared from them. We will we'll, we'll flee from, from fear. We, we might even, you know, uh, be terrified by their appearance. So that's why they're always appearing in a very anthropomorphic, meaning humanoid, if you will, appearance. And even on the icons, we paint, we iconize the angels in that way so we can understand, we can relate to them in a much easier way. But if you see a cherubim or a seraphim or the, the thrones or any of the the angelic uh, hosts that are being described in the hierarchy of the divine hierarchy, it will be mind-blowing. Are, we are not capable of uh, processing their, their appearance to us. And that's why every time when they appear, they say, do not be afraid or peace be unto you. So what you see, you not get scared and so forth. We have to understand we cannot attribute to God human emotions or passions, anger and wrath all the way. But the language of the Bible uses those things in order to to explain to us it says the right hand of the lord created this and this and this yes but that's the human way of explaining this uh anthropological style of, of the bible is very familiar very uh, known very present in the bible and that's why we need to um, be careful how we uh, understand that so uh we we stopped uh, uh from we're going to continue from uh slide nine uh, here where the doctrine of the apocatastasis leads to a denial of god's love uh, uh, the, the of god's love itself so we'll uh explain into the what we call still the the metaphysical argument so we can move on into the juridical and moral and juridical argument of why this heresy is wrong is that 
the conception of the universal salvation denying the perpetuity of gates at the same time also ignores the ineffable mystery of God's love. Because you see the heretics of the apocatastasis, they say that the gates, the, the torments in hell would have an end. And after that, there will be a full restoration, even to the fallen angels. The angels, the demons will become again angels as they were before the fall. So ignores this heresy. At the same time, also ignores the ineffable mystery of God's love, which is higher than all our rational or sentimental concepts and the mystery of the human person and its freedom. God's love assumes total respect for his creations, right up to voluntary powerlessnesses to deny them freedom. And this is from Martin Madrid Plakidas, the say, death is conquered. The last times, uh, we, according to the teaching of the fathers of the church uh, or from the book of Alpha and Omega uh, in, published in 2000. So thus, the position of, uh, the, of the adherence of the apocatastasis leads not only to the denial of the value of human freedom, but to the denial both of divine justice and of divine love. So why did freedom? Freedom because if we say that God will forgive all of our sins, and we, because of that, we can remove, we don't have to obey Christ, we don't have to follow anything that the church says and so forth. There is no reason, actually, God made a mistake for creating church on earth. That's the way it leads to, so because I can live my life the way I want, and I, if I choose to live in sin, at the end, if that's forgiven, then it gives me the exemption of living a life of what I want, and uh, even if the devil is also going to be saved, then what's the point of being moral? What's the point of being um, God-like or, or living according to the measurement of Christ or the image or likeness of God? Why the freedom? Because then my freedom is being in question. God is one who creates everything. And even though I don't want to be with him, with God, he will disregard my freedom and he will still nevertheless bring me into the state of restoration. This is a very serious problem because the ontological right to be free is essential of what we call the theology of the Christian church. We can be free even if we want that freedom to be abused, perverted, to be against God. God loves us so much that even when we are against him, he respects our freedom. And we will talk about today that many of the saints are going to describe to us what happened to those people in hell at the time of the resurrection of Christ, because as you know, the resurrection icon of Christ stands with Adam and Eve holding hands of Christ. That's Christ holding the hands of Adam and Eve and pulling them out of hell and bringing them into the light of resurrection. And with them, not just the sinners, but everyone who was in hell, because at the time before Christ's resurrection, the devil had the power and death had dominion over our life, but not after uh, Christ's resurrection. So totally in vain do certain modern theologians oppose these two attributes to an extreme degree, attempting to present them as mutually exclusive. Neither the scripture nor the holy tradition of the church speaks to us of such a categorical contraposition. One cannot deny the other in as much as divine justice is one of the expressions of divine love. He says this, he mentions certain theologians talking about, unfortunately, even some bishops we're trying to reconstitute origin as the saint of the church, that we should disregard some of his teachings. Uh, or uh, even though he was an influential author, but there is a reason why the church, even though it has full respect for everything else that he did, and was uh, the reason why he inspired so many saints later who will become saints to become the fathers of the church. Unfortunately, his teaching has to be corrected, has to be straightened forward so that we know the Bible is a book um, and the theology of the church doesn't um, discriminate or tries to hide certain things, but tells us everything that we need to know because it's, it's saying the truth. And the truth sometimes is unpleasant to hear, but it's the truth. That's the only way how we learn. The Bible could have easily hide the fact that, let's say, Lot, after he left Sodoma and Gomorrah, after his wife died because she turned back and saw Sodom and Gomorrah, he slept with his daughters in a cave, not because he wanted, he got drunk and his daughters slept. That's a pure incest. Obviously, that's a sin. And the Bible could have easily hide that fact, but it didn't so that we can know the full truth of what extent. The Bible could also hide the fact that uh, Peter didn't deny 
Christ. That maybe we can skip that part because Peter still became the leader of the apostle, meaning uh, he, he was the one who also sacrificed a lot uh, because of Christ and the gospel, but not. The Bible is telling us everything that happened to Peter, everything that happened to Judas, who even hanged himself. Same way the church does not ignore the fact that Origen, even though he's respected father, his teachings were heretical. So not all of them, but especially this about the apocatosis. And unfortunately, are being now resurrected by certain modern theologians or people who want to call themselves theologians. And instead of uh, speaking about theology and theologizing, they're ent actually intellectualizing. And that's a very big problem because the theology will become a saloon orthodoxy. When in one hand we Starbucks and the one when we have cigarette and with our mouth we speak about St. Gregory Palama. That cannot uh, pass. That's not theology. That's everything else but not theology. The theology is a way of life. Dogma, dogmatics and the God's revealed truth, it's not something that should be spoken only, but above all, it should be lived. So this is very important to understand. The teaching set forth by the Holy Fathers of the Orthodox Church on retribution explains why the dualism, that contradiction between um, the contradiction between divine justice and love, which various heretical sects have not been able to resolve, never arose in their minds. The Fathers understood God's justice in keeping with Scripture. Not in the sense of punishing anger, but in the sense of an attribute of God, according uh, to which God renders to each free being in accordance with his deeds, thus is consistent with what that person has determined for himself. God's justice is guided not by feeling of by a feeling of offense, but by the moral quality of existence. This justice cannot contradict love, for it is compelled not by a desire for satisfaction that excludes love, but by the downright impossibility of denying himself of granting peace and life to iniquity. This is from Patriarch, Patriarch Sergius uh, Starogorodsky, the Orthodox Teaching on Salvation, uh, published in Moscow in 1991 in, and, uh, uh, in Russia. So, for example, now we, we're moving to what we call the moral argument, why this teaching cannot uh, be right, says in brief, for example, that salvation of all must take place because the God of love cannot punish. And this is what we constantly we hear from the New Age so-called theologians, you know, I'm putting them in, in quotes because they're not theologians, they're everything else but not theologians. Uh, and the example they would give for, uh, that we have here is uh, the general accepted understanding of eternal torments is merely a scholastic opinion, a simplistic theology, disciplinary, which disregards the prof profundity of such texts as, for example, John 3, 17, which says, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And they use this as an argument. So God cannot punish and later on in, uh, in John 12, 47, God also, Christ says, and if anyone hears my words and does not believe, I do not judge him, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. As Christ also continues and says, I came here to save the sinners, not the righteous ones. I have not come for the righteous, but I come for, came for the sinners. And who are the sinners? All of us. So can one imagine Along, that along with the eternal nat nature of the kingdom of God, the God of love is preparing the eternal nature of hates, which would in some sense be a breakdown of divine design, a victory if only in part of hates. The pedagogical argument of fear no longer works, but risks drawing Christianity closer to Islam. I've told you many times that the rationalizing of the fate of Christianity is no different than Islam when it comes to the predetermination or the determination, when it comes to understanding and trying to make conclusions based on uh, of God's nature, of God's action into the world, based on our anthropological understanding of things, human ways of, of thinking, human ways of comparing things. So what is the basis, basic mistake of this thesis? The thesis that Salvation of all must take place because the God of love cannot punish. This is a simplistic form of understanding. That optimist, of course, in quotes, theologians understand the torments of hates as an action on God's part, whereas the Holy Father started that it is a result engendered by a person himself. Moreover, 
The epistle, the Patriarch of the Eastern Catholic Church on the Orthodox faith directly gives over to anathema those who teach that God is the author of the eternal punishment of unrepented sinners. This is from the dogmatic epistles of Orthodox hierarchy of the 17th and 19th centuries on the Orthodox faith, the Holy Trinity, St. Sergius Lavra in 1995 published. So it is not at all God who is preparing the perpetuity of hates. Hades, according to the idea of St. Maximus of Egypt, uh, lies in the depths of human heart. This is from his spiritual discourses. As St. Simon, the new theologian, will say, just as blind people who do not see the shining sun, just as the blind people do, who do not see the shining sun, although they are entirely illumined by it, are exterior to the light being removed from it by sense and sight, so also the divine light of the Trinity will be in everything. But sinners imprisoned in darkness, even in the midst of it, will not see it. But burned and condemned by their own conscience, they will have unspeakable torment and inexpressible sorrow unto the ages. That same light, in other words, this is from his works in volume three, that shines in its presence even in the most deepest parts of the hell, uh, because God is present everywhere. And for many who are in the paradise, who are in the bosom of Christ, the bosom of God, it's the light of comfort, of peace, of tranquility, of joy, of happiness, of closeness with God can be also that same light with those who have alienated themselves from God, a torment can become a, a, a light that burns, a light that scorches, a light that tortures because we're not used to. It. So basically our state of hell or paradise, it depends also on our growth and likeness of Christ. As Christ says, when I come to the world again, when the Son of Man returns, will he find fate uh, among people, among, among humankind? Asking very interesting question because the measurement of our likeness to God, are we are God's children or not, depends on whether God will reflect, will he find himself, will he see himself in us? As he says, when I was naked, did you? gave me clothes when I was thirsty, you gave me to drink when I was in prison and in, uh, and in a hospital, you came and visited me. If you have done any, to, any of those things to any of these little ones, you have done it to me. So if uh, we have not acquired the mindset of Christ, we have, no, we have not clothed ourselves with Christ, how can Christ recognize himself in us? That's the very beginning of hell. And Christ says, go away because I don't know you. Meaning I cannot see myself in you. You're strangers to me. That alienation, that strangeness, it's our choice. So back in the second century, St. Irene of Lyon explained this. And to as many as continue in their love towards God, <clears throat> because we're going to continue with the moral argument, quote by St. Irene of Lyon, and as to as many as continue in their love towards God, does he grant communion with him? Communion with God is life and light and the enjoyment of all the benefits which he has in store. But, and as many as, according to their own choice, depart from God, he inflicts that separation from himself, which they have chosen of their own accord. But separation from God is death, and separation from light is darkness, and separation from God consists in the loss of all the benefits which he has in store. Now, good things are eternal and without end with God, and therefore, the loss of this is also eternal and never end. It is in this matter, just as those who have blinded themselves or have been blinded by others are forever deprived of the enjoyment of light. It is not, however, that the light has inflicted upon them the penalty of blindness, but it is, but it is that the blindness itself has brought calamity upon them. This is St. Irene of Lyon in uh, his work against the heresies. Say, Irene of Lyon is one of those first church fathers, as you remember. I think we talked with him, with Father Matthew. He was uh, telling his biography. We, we had a talk about St. Irene of Lyon, um, who is the one of those saints who were the first descendants of the apostles, and possibly they were children when Christ was on earth in Jerusalem and preaching um, his word. So, yes, we can say God is love. 
as John says in 4, 16, 1 John uh, uh, chapter 4, verse 16. And this love will be all in all. Because now we are coming back to the argument that the salvation of all must take place because the God of love cannot punish. So we say, yes, God is love, according to St. John. And, uh, and this love will, all, will be all in all, as we read in 1 Corinthians. Um, uh, time shall, uh, in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter uh, 15, verse uh, 28. But for those who have chosen self-love and hatred, it will become the fire of hates. And we have said this many times. You can't just say love is love. Like some people are trying to fool the innocent uh, people who are not spiritually discerning and say love is love. But then pedophilia is also love because in the very word of pedo, pedo, pedos, pedia, in Greek means ch children or uh, child or children, pedi, to pedi. Philia means also love. It's another word for love in Greek. Is that love? No, that's abuse. That's a sin, horrible sin. So we can't just say generically love is love because it's not. Um, God is love, but love is not God. That Those are two different things. And Father Metropolitan Antonasius of Lemesu emphasized this. He says, God is love, but love is not God. We cannot make an idol out of God and worship love instead of God. Because God is beyond love, beyond above anything. So when we say God is love, because that's the highest word we can, highest attribute we can give to the, his transcendence. So, but the, for those who have chosen self-love and hatred, it will become the fire of hates. The word of St. Isaac the Syrian testify on this. Those, and we have here on the slide, those who are punished in Gehenna, that's another word for hate or hell, are scourged by the scourge of love. And this is in his uh, schedule of homilies of St. Isaac the Syrian. And it's translated in, uh, uh, the, in English uh, from Boston, uh, in Boston from Holy Transfiguration Monastery in 1984. Uh, and if you are interested in reading any of the, the fathers or in front of English, feel free, I'll give you the notes so you can see it for yourself. So some uh, say that the fire of Geena or the AIDS bears a cleansing character and supposedly has its food this has as its food the sins of one of or another person or of the demons who are cast therein that's one of the explanations that the gana or the hell before the restoration will be like a some sort of like a purgatory uh, a place where we're going to be purged through the eternal fire of torment that will purify us and the sinful nature will somehow washed away will be burned off and then we can come back into the restoration. That's the heresy that I'm saying. That's the teaching. With time, this food, meaning the, the sins of the fallen angels and the sins of the sinners, with time, this food is consumed in the fire and finding no place for itself in purified nature. The fire disappears. Thus, does the restoration take place. For one person a year will be enough for another a century, and another will be tormented for millennia. But this is not how it is, and torment cannot be of long or short duration because as we read in revelation 10 6 there shall time no longer there shall be no time no longer i'm sorry here i have misspelled this one. i mean i, I uh, not but there shall be um, time no longer the eternity of this state will be outside of time there is no time after we die we enter into this state of eternity there will be time from point a to point b there will be no measurements as we measure into this dimension, this time and space dimension that we live in today. So attempting to resolve the question of how to reconcile divine love with the torments of hates in this way, the optimists, that's how Father George Maximov calls these people, the, the, uh, the resurrectors, if you will, of the, the heresy of the catastasis of the 20th and the 21st century, create a no less complicated dilemma. After all, proclaiming an inevitable restoration of all, in quotations, in God, they fall into the insanity of compulsory paradise. Of course, in quotes. In the future age, it will be totally impossible not to know or not to love God. This love is the law of existence there. According to Father uh, Sergius Bulgakov, the Bride of the Lamp, uh, is, uh, uh, a very known theologian. With such an approach, the heavenly Jerusalem is turned into a concentration camp. So this is very important to understand that the depth 
of the deception of these heresies is profound. And if people are not uh, have don't we don't we don't have spiritual discernment, we can easily go along with the optimistic theology of the apocatastasis or the restoration. So <clears throat> perhaps the optimist theologians, as we call them by now, believe that at the foundation of sin lies merely ignorance of God's goodness. It remains only for men to learn of it, even after death and the general resurrection, and he will repent and fall in tears before the Lord's feet, and the Lord will, of course, pardon and receive him, say the optimist. So, I have sinned, I have this, but then when I die, when I see that I have spent my whole life in sin and in darkness, now, because God is merciful beyond measure, there is no way that he will not forgive me. Otherwise, this is very important, He's not the God of love. He's not the real God because he's not merciful. He only relies on his justice because God is not just love and merciful. God is also just. And now he, we have a problem. Now we accuse God. God is imperfect, insufficient. Who else is better? Lucifer, who allows me to give everything that I have, everything that I need to love myself, to live the life that I want, even if it means to live a life in sin. If only that were true, indeed, if only all sinners, while still in this life, would bring forth true repentance. Well, glory to God if people do that, if we all do that. It would be even better if no one sinned at all. Of course. Unfortunately, however, that is not how it is. Because at the foundation of sin lies not ignorance, but the personal will of a rational being. After all, both the devil and Adam knew the goodness of God much better than we did. But they chose sin and fell as we said many times the serpent the devil doesn't offer adam uh, a billion dollars he doesn't give him uh, a good i don't know some special food or, or ferrari or or a space rocket or whatever he gives him something that he can bite for that he can go for the idea to become god without god and adam bites to the sin with eve of course and that's the moment that St. Maximus, the confessor, says that's the moment when Adam fell into sin, when he diverted himself from God, alienated himself, he stopped singing to God, he stopped conversing with God, he stopped um, contemplating God because he was preoccupied with the idea of becoming God himself in a shortcut, in a, in a short way like the, the serpent was offering to him. So among the angels and people who followed the devil are precisely those for whom self-love and evil were conscious choices. It is silly to argue about whether the devil can or cannot repent when he does not want to repent. That's the essence of, of the whole thing, why the devil will not want to repent. I'll tell you an example about St. Paisius. He said when he was a young monk, but uh, he had a fervent prayer. And one night when he was by himself in the soul, he said that he was overwhelmed with grace and such a love from God that he was saying to God, please withdraw from me, back, back off from me, because this grace is so amazing that my heart will explode. I'll have a heart attack. You'll kill me, O oh Lord, with your love, in a way. And in that state of, of uh, we call it umilenie, in state of uh, spiritual uh, contemplation at the same time, you know, he was like on the third uh, heaven. Idea came to our mind that he, because he loved everything that he saw, even the insects, the, the trees, was everything was so beautiful. Everything he understood the meaning and the, 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 of the existence of everything. He had a thought that why did God, who is so powerful in his love and love, loves everything and created everything out of love, including the fallen angels, cannot have mercy on the on the demons and because of his inexperience at the time he started praying because he was a young monk about the devil he said to have the lord have mercy on the devils but then he heard a knocking on the window in the middle of the night while he was praying and when he pulled the curtain he saw the devil with his face making this grimace this this arrogant mocking uh, expression on his face mocking uh, St. Paisio's prayer for him. And then he said, I realized then that uh, the devil doesn't want to be saved, that he has made his choice with a constant decision. He's a spirit. He made a conscious decision much more 
profoundly that we can sometimes do because sometimes we also make mistakes when we fall into sin because of our ignorance as well, which is also a sin. Ignorance is a sin. Read the Proverbs in the Bible that it is written. So what is God to do with those who do not want to be with him? That's a very important question. That's where our freedom lies. Throw them by the scurf of the neck into paradise. Annihilate them. Not create them. The Lord does not take any of those paths precisely because he loves his creation. God is not sorry to give life even to those whom he knows will hate him. St. Gregory Palamas says, because of his innate godness, goodness and enormous goodness and mercy, God did not stop bringing good people into being on account of those who would become evil by their own fault, says Gregory Palamas. Rather, for the sake of the good, he created those who would become evil. Let me repeat this one once again. St. Gregory Palama says, because of his enormous goodness and mercy, God did not stop bringing good people into being on account of those who would become evil by their own fault or their own choice. Rather, for the sake of the good, he created those who would become evil. This is in his homilies part two. In God, if God were only to create those who would love him, he would be likened to sinners and would not be able to say, and in, we read this in Luke uh, chapter 6, 32 to 35, if ye love them which love you, what thing have you? For sinners also love those that love them, but love ye your enemies and do good, and ye shall be the children of the highest, for he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. This is in Luke, uh, the words of Christ. So we know that God's love extends to the point of granting existence even to the enemies, even to blasphemers. How can one maintain that they will be saved if salvation is God himself and they do not want to be with him? If you embrace someone who does not want to be embraced, this will produce even greater irritation. That's not love. That's um, imposement. That's... Uh, there is something fundamentally wrong when we force people to love us. Love cannot be forced. That's why God does not force his love to those who don't want to love. Because they have the freedom not to love. As we have freedom to love. Real love does not impose itself and God does not impose himself upon those who have turned away from him. They receive what they have deserved, what they have chosen. Even the most powerful God is powerless when it comes to our freedom because if he violates or impose infringe upon our freedom that means that he's not god but he is a tyrant and that's exactly what this heresy if being accepted would easily lead theologically speaking that actually the god that we uh, trust that we love that we're being told about is actually the satan not the other that's the argument of the luciferians actually adam and eve were being kept as prisoners in the Garden of Eden. And God was the tyrant who was the, 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 the keeper of the, this prison. While Adam and Eve were being freed by the true Savior, the true Messiah, the true Redeemer, the serpent, the light bearer, the Lucifer, the morning star. That's the, the twisted aspect of the theology already. Everything is upside down. Everything that is normal is considered to be not normal. Everything that is moral and ethical is considered to be immoral and ethical, and ethic, unethical. Everything that is black is be becoming white. Everything that is um, in one way, it's, it's uh, portrayed in a different way. And we live in the world of upside down. We live in the world of, of uh, absurd contradictions where the justification of it are being measured because of our feelings. So that means that uh, this is the delusion goes thus far. Imagine if I wake up one day and I tell all of you, please don't call me now Father Borean. From now on, I am President Borean of the world. Of course, it's a stupid statement because no one elected me. And I can be that only in my head, in my imagination. And I cannot impose my position on you. Just because I identify myself as some sort of a president, that doesn't mean that that 
corresponds with the reality. But we live in a world where people can say, well, I'm a squirrel or I'm a president or I identify as this and that. And because we don't want to offend their feelings, we say, it's okay, you can be whatever you want. However, the reality hits and the reality of death that the church is constantly re reminding us is the real reality when we're going to have to face our creator. That's why uh, we'll move on into the juridical uh, argument. We're not going to try, we're not going to be able to finish everything because I want to go to a more important topic, which is we're not going to be able to finish there. That will be for the following uh, Wednesday uh, when we're going to try to answer the question. Uh, which is the argument based on the incorrectly understood teachings of Christ, descent in hand, hates, and we're going to talk about the Fifth Ecumenical Council and what exactly the Fifth Ecumenical Council um, uh, uh, destroys or, or debunks the, the theory, the apocatastasis heresy of origin. Um, yes, Mark uh, is uh, giving us a quote here. He says from Isaiah chapter 520, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. This is exactly what, what uh, we, we're trying to, to, to cover. That's very, very important. So the juridical argument will go in brief. Salvation must take place because it is unjust to eternally punish for temporal sin. So salvation must take place because it is unjust to eternally punish for temporal sin. Look at, look at, look at just the statement, how demonic it is. I measure God because God doesn't know what he's doing. So no, salvation is not real because it will be unjust uh, to eternal punishment. For, for something that's called a temporal sin. That's very important. So the question comes, or the example that we can uh, come up with is, can the God of love proclaimed by Christ punish endlessly for the sins of temporal life? It is, is it possible that the might of evil is so great that it will exist when the Lord reigns in all? This is uh, uh, from uh, Archpriest Alexander Ming. Son of God, very good book, uh, if you want to uh, read. So St. John Chrysostom answered these arguments in this way. Don't say to me, where is justice if torment has no end? When God does something, obey his decision and do not subject them to human intellectualizing. If you demand fairness, then according to the law of justice, we should have perished straight away at the very beginning. This is St. John in his teachings, volume, te volume two. St. Augustine, um, let me see here. St. Augustine, or Blessed Augustine, likewise criticized those who think it is unjust that any man be doomed to an eternal punishment for sins, which no matter how great they were, were perpetrated in a brief space of time, as if any law ever regulated the duration of the punishment by the duration of the offense punished. Must the criminal be confined only for so long a time as he spent on the offense for which he is committed? Asks the question in his The City of God. Additional St. Justinian the Great, he was an emperor, rightly noted there is not much fairness in the idea that those who to the end led a life filled with perfection should be joined to transgressors and pederasts or the pedophiles, pederasts, pederastia is called also, and that both the one and the other should delight in identical blessings. This is from uh, St. Justinian the Great Epistle to the Holy Council on origin and those of one mind with him. We'll talk about this uh, the, uh, uh, on the acts of the Fifth Ecumenical Councils some other time because that's also important to exactly see what the fathers are talking about so when we hear all this nonsense from so-called theologians uh, who you know they call themselves theologians but they are failing on the basic uh, theology we need to read first the fathers and the decisions of the church that were done in the sixth century for example in this case uh, in, in the on the fifth ecumenical councils which is happening in the, in the sixth century and then finally um, uh, we, we have, it, it is worth paying attention to how St. Gregory, the diologist, answers uh, this question. He was the, the Pope of Rome, a, a holy man. Uh, this, which you say, might have some reason. If the just judge 
did only consider the sins committed and not the minds with which they were committed. For the reason why wicked men made an end of sinning was that they also made an end of their life. Meaning, the reason why we die we are biological death is that the biological death prevents us to make evil be eternal. If we live eternal life with our biological bodies, then our uh, sinfulness or our, our choice to be evil will live for us forever. And then evil, we have an ontological existence or essential existence. For willingly they would, had it been in their power, meaning for those who sin, have lived without end, that they might in like manner have sinned without end. This is exactly what St. Gregory the Dialogist uh, is talking about here. And this is from the Dialogues of St. Gregory. It was uh, also published um, uh, uh, so also published in English. Meaning, in other words, so evil can become immortal. We said many times that evil does not have an ontological state. There is no such thing as we call evil exists forever. Because if we say that, then there is another God, the God of evil, and we'll go into that uh, nonsense, yin yang, that uh, every good has an evil and so forth. No, evil is a perversion of our free will, of our perversion of our relationship with God. So, for example, let's talk about uh, a very simple example. When people have, uh, we know uh, people love each other, and because they love each other, a man and a woman, as the product of their life, of their love, as a proof, visible manifestation of love, is their children. They are becoming even the likeness of their own parents. But if the love between the two parents is only because of the, let's say, the pleasure of having children, then this love is not perfect. It becomes a passion. It becomes a perverted distortion of their love. That's one example. Uh, uh, there are many other examples like that. When we, the, the, everything that God created, including that sexual desire, was created so that people can have, can bring children into, to multiply the world. But we are actually using the, the, the desire on its own, becomes the means. For example, it's not wrong, it's not evil to be wealthy. As a matter of fact, to be wealthy is a sign that God has given you many tools, He's entrusted us with something. But it's sinful and wrong to be wealthy if we use our wealth to only justify uh, our, our own needs and disregard the distribution of the wealth to those who also need. So Christ is not a socialist. Christ is, uh, is God. And those are the ideas that, uh, that, that to explain the perversion of evil, that the evil can somehow, if we don't, that doesn't happen, the evil can itself become immortal. And of course, um, uh, we, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll pause here because uh, I, I was, we want to cover that the thought is repeated by the one, uh, by the outstanding 15th century theologian, Joseph Brynus, who pointed out that it is incorrect to pose a question about eternal punishment for temporal deeds, since it is the inner disposition of a man that is judged by God, which is only reflected by his deeds truly believing and virtuous people have an immortal inclination towards the good and therefore they go to endless blessedness while those have having an irrevocable inclination to sin go to internal punishment this is from um, his uh, dialogue within uh, ismailites uh, ishmaelites or the muslims anyway we'll pause here because it's uh, 7 uh, 10 so we're almost an hour uh, then we'll uh, uh, we'll, we'll we'll stop here, of course. Then we'll of course uh, continue with the the, the we we'll change the topic, which we're going to talk about the argument based on an incorrectly understood teaching on Christ's descent in his, which is the reason why this here is exists in the first place, and is so popular. And we will of course uh, try to see what the fathers have to say when it comes to um, uh, this. Uh, Saint Justin Pope, which talks of this, and then the Holy Fathers on the idea of universal salvation and the Fifth Ecumenical Council, and the condemnation of originism. Of course, we don't have time to do that now. We'll hopefully we'll finish that in the following Bible studies, but we will 
uh, that will be our maybe in the next uh, couple of weeks we'll finish with this topic uh, my intention is here to to just introduce you to what you might hear in various ways in various forms about people for example who today say well god is good god is love and he will forgive everyone so basically even we even if we live a life of sinfulness that eventually you know that ain't no sin can any in any way uh, overburden uh, god's mercy that's true if we suppose that there is a repentance that there is an awareness in our sight that we're doing a sin and that's why it's important to cover this topic to understand all the aspects and why the church was so rigorous when it came to this don't forget origin initially understood by the fathers was a very productive very intelligent very good theologian in his own merit and many fathers of the church are praising him uh, as as a person who was responsible to uh, about a lot of things and father deacon matt you talked about uh, him in extensiveness and we know all of this however the church wants to be honest with us because the church doesn't belong to the feelings of you or people it belongs to the holy spirit the holy spirit speaks the truth so let us uh, be attentive to all of these things if you have any questions of course well uh, we can take a break and uh, talk about that but um, this is, will be uh, enough for today so we can um, uh, wrap it up uh yeah mark once again thank you for that quote it's very important um that uh, perspective of the world that we have today where everything is upside down perfectly aligns with the uh, prophet isaiah uh, i think you can all read in the chat woe unto them that call evil good and good evil that put darkness for light and light for darkness that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter we live in the world but unfortunately more and more that's obvious so as christians we have to be aware of this and uh, as the fathers are telling us just read be calm be patient but read the signs of the time do not get upset and then you will see what time is it may god uh, help us all uh, okay um okay that will be all for for tonight guys we'll uh, have to stop here and then uh, we'll see you. Uh, we'll see you soon. We have uh, paraclesis on Friday. We have uh, liturgy on on Sunday as usual. Uh, Saturday we have, of course, vespers from six. In the meantime, we'll continue with our catechism next Tuesday and God willing next uh, Wednesday with our Bible studies. Hopefully, we'll finish this topic uh, in a couple of weeks, and then uh, hopefully Father Matthew will uh, be able to continue because he is moving still, and and maybe he can. Um, continue with his section of the Bible studies and we have more interesting topics to cover. I want to remind you all uh, that uh, me and Chris and Father Matthew and my wife are planning to start uh, in October a parents and teenage kids uh, a Zoom group where we're going to talk about different topics uh, that the parents are interested about and the children are interested so we can communicate and relate to each other all the things that we're going through as a society, as a culture, so they can, we can also learn what the fathers of the church have to say about this. So we'll be there and hopefully that will be working as well. Also, people are open to join us as, uh, as well if they want to. Okay, let's say the prayer and let's finish for today. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, both now and ever into the ages of ages, amen. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The kingdom come that will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, both now and ever into the ages of ages. Amen. Lord of mercy, Lord of mercy, Lord of mercy, through the prayers of our Holy Fathers, Lord Jesus Christ, the mercy in us and save us. Amen.